Hi everybody from Digital 33. Welcome to our first ever online coaches clinic. So first let me talk about Little League. So the purpose of Little League is not just baseball. Yes, we love winning. We love bringing home those flags, but our sole purpose is to make better people, to give kids that experience of baseball to make better people. So we're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them how to be responsible, teaching them work ethic, how to work as a team, how to lose with class, how to win with class, how to face your problems head on, how to get a goal, figure out how you're going to achieve it and then actually go for it and do it. Um, so that when they grow up, they can grow up to be good functioning adults and then they're more employable, they're better people. And that is what our focus is. Not so much just winning a game. So if you think about it, less than 1% of these kids are going to be MLB players. It's great if they do, but realistically, they're not all going to be MLB players. And so we want to focus on the bigger picture and not just winning Little League games. So as a coach, you must lead by example. You're a role model not only for your players and the kids on the field, but you're also a role model for the other adults, including the parents. So if they hear you saying, oh, this umpire is making bad calls, they're going to repeat the same thing on the outside of the fence, start a little rally going on, and it's going to cause a hostile environment. But if you keep your cool, you're like, oh, no, it's okay. I feel like that was a bad call, but he's calling the, you know, it evens out on both sides. It's okay. Um, or, yeah, maybe he made a bad, bad call, but there's nothing we can do about that. Let's focus on what we can do next. Um, so remember that you are a role model for not just the kids, but for the parents as well. And other coaches, you may have some newer coaches and they look to you as an example of how they will then act as a coach. You represent your team, your community, your league, and so you wanna put your best foot forward. So your team, as manager and coach, you are responsible for keeping your, key, your team organized and all in line. So you want to make sure that you have rules and you want to make sure you're consistent, which means the rule when the manager in charge should be the same rules when a coach is in charge. And if for whatever reason, a coach manager has to leave and a parent has to come in, the same rules apply. So that way the kids don't think it's a free for all when the manager is not there. So make sure that you make those rules known first day of practice. These are the rules and make sure you follow through because the moment you stop following through, those kids will eat you up. So you have to make sure that you stay consistent with your rules. Be available with your communication. So make sure your parents can get a hold of you, your kids can get a hold of you. Uh, you want to make sure that there's an open communication between everybody so that way you're all on the same page and if somebody needs something, they feel comfortable enough that they can come to you with a problem. This will be especially important when you get into injuries um, and you and your parent have to work with a return to play protocol. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's good to know the protocols just in case. Another thing is expectations. Make sure that everybody's clear of the expectations, what they can expect from you. You're gonna to be to practice on time. You're gonna teach skills in a certain way. You're going to push the kids, but not too much or whatever it is that your expectations are from them to have for you. And then vice versa, what do you expect from them? You expect them to get their kids on time, for them to have their gloves, to have a water bottle each practice. Whatever those expectations are, make sure they're clear from both sides from day one. The other things you need to remember as a coach with your team is to be prepared. So what that means is you come in with plan A. I'm going to run this drill, then this drill, then that drill. Plan B. Uh-oh, I'm the only coach that showed up and I've got 20 kids. What are you going to do? Okay, plan B. And then plan C, I want to do all these drills with these stations, but only five kids showed up. All right, so we can adjust. We'll do a hitting practice and focus on this or focus on skills that we couldn't do as a big group. So make sure you have plan A, plan B, plan C, all the way through Z, because in Little League, things happen. So you have to be prepared for all of it. So things have changed since we were little. It used to be elbow up, do it a certain way, very rigid on things. And nowadays it's not so much. There's new science and people are learning different ways of doing things. And uh, so stay up to date on what's current and what's new. Um, go online, take extra clinics, whatever. Just make sure that you know your stuff. So your responsibilities as managers and coaches. You have to make sure you prep the fields, lock up the equipment after use, bring the equipment to games, have your balls, have your equipment. The manager is responsible to make sure that they have the binder with the medical releases and they all have wet signatures and those will be at every game and every practice. 
We'll get to that in a little bit. Also, they have to know how to report an injury in case that happens, and that will go to your safety officer. They have to keep pitch count. Now that can be done by the coach or the manager and any of these responsibilities, the manager and the coach can decide, okay, you be responsible for this. Um, and the manager will, will let them know or her what they need help with and they can delegate um, because you're a coaching team, not just one person handing out things. So that person can get help from the coaching team. So as you know, since you were here taking a clinic, you know that uh, clinics are required. So there's a couple things that are required to coach. One, the background check or volunteer app. You must do that every year. Once you're done, you're good for the year. Now there's three one time only and you take them once and they're good for your entire coaching career so far, as we know, unless they change state laws. But right now it's just once and you're good to go. Uh, the, the concussion training, abuse awareness, which is mandatory reporting, and the CPR or sudden cardiac arrest. Each one of those, you will get a link from your coach coordinator or president. You click on the link, do the class, take the test, and you get a little certificate. I suggest you take a screenshot of that certificate with your name on it because during tournaments or games, if anybody asks for it, which they will, you can just pull it up on your phone instead of having to find it somewhere in your binder or papers. Take a screenshot to show it to them, and then you're good to go for that tournament. And the last thing is the coach's skills clinic, the fundamentals, and the safety clinic. Those are required depending on the league every year or every couple years. District requirement is you must be current within the last two years. So for this year, 2021, you can have 2019, 2020, or 2021 in order to coach. However, there is the rule that whoever is on site with the players must be current with 2021. So if there's a game and the manager who has 2021 is not there and the coaches only have 2020, then that team cannot play until someone that has the current 2021 year can play. So because of that, it makes sense to just take it every year. Um, also, it's good to take clinics because even though, like I've been coaching over 10 years, I know some of you have been here longer than me. And so, you know what's at the clinics, you know what you're going to get. But I mean, even I learn new things every time I go. It may not be a different drill, but it might be a different way to approach a skill, a different way to teach something uh, that you already know. Because once you have a couple different ways of teaching something, you've got all that in your repertoire, then you can teach that to the kids a lot better. So it's always going to take clinics. So one of the first things that you are going to do with your new team is to send them a welcome email. So back in the day, it used to be a little handout, but nowadays everything's online. So just send them an email. Um, you know, you could do it old school if you want. It's up to you. So basically, you're just going to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm coach so-and-so. These are our coaches. These are our practice coaches. Um, and then you'll tell them the rules, the expectations, what they can expect from you, what you expect from them, pertinent dates and so tournaments, practice days, game days, a pitcher day. You want to make sure they know all of that and then what they need to buy. So some people come in and they're very new to baseball, especially if you're teaching t-ball and they don't know what they need. So you can say, oh, well, our league provides the belts and the hats and the shirts. So you need to buy the pants and the socks. Some leagues provide the socks. So find out what they need to buy and you can say, we provide this, you need to provide that. And then they know exactly what to expect going on and it's right there in writing. And part of that welcome letter, you're going to include the team rules. So on there, this was mine from a few years ago, just be on time, be responsible. For, for the older kids, I have them clean up their own dugout. I don't have the moms coming in here, tying laces, putting their, putting their stuff back in their backpacks. For minors and above, you can even start this at caps. Start having them be responsible for their own stuff. At the end, put your glove in your bag, make sure you throw your water bottle out, um, stuff like that to teach them responsibility. Um, and we it says here, team gear first, personal gear second. So we have the team put away, the tea, the L screen, um, the catcher's gear, and then they can pack away their own stuff because you want them just packing their stuff and neglecting the rest of it. And this again, helps foster that team environment. And then no one leaves a dugout too clean, be respectful. This includes to other adults and to players and players on other teams. We don't want them in the dugout making fun of people. That's not cool. Vol which says violence of any kind will not be tolerated. That's horseplay. Um, sometimes you're like, oh, it's just a little bit. It's fine, but it escalates quickly. And once you allow something, then something else bigger that will happen. And they'll say, well, why didn't you call it out here? It becomes the whole thing. So if I were you, I would just make sure you have the rules and uh, make everybody abide by them from the beginning so you don't have to worry about that in the future. So let's go over the basic practice structure. 
So this is not a set in stone way to do things. It's just an example. First, you're gonna start with warm ups. Most people, yeah, you should start with warm ups. Do some dynamic, which are moving stretches, and then some static stretches where, where you're holding them for a couple of um, seconds up to a minute or two. So you want to make sure that you include both. Then you want to reinforce your basic skills. So how to throw, um, just basic catching. Um, you could do last man standing where you just have them feel the ball as shortstop, throw it to first. But do your basic skills first. Um, with the bigger kids, you might do it for an hour or so. But you want to reinforce the basic skills. Then once you have that, then you can introduce a new skill. Like today we're going to practice leading off. Um, so reinforce the basics, then introduce the new one. You don't want to introduce more than one new one at a time. You don't want to confuse the kids. Let it have time to sink in. And then you want to end everything in a fun drill. We usually do the bucket drill, the helmet drill. I do the helmet drill. So you take a couple helmets and you stack them up. Um, and then you the kids line up on the infield, the infield grass, and they all get to throw the balls at it one at a time. Don't let them all throw at once and we'll be able to know whose is whose. Um, they go one at a time and whoever hits it or knocks it down gets what's underneath there. And I will put candy, check for allergies first, um, or a dollar bill, or with my high schoolers, put like five bucks in there. Um, it's great. They love it and it's fun. You can do classic bucket drill. You can have where they chase each other around the bases and last man standing wins. Um, there's so many different fun drills to do. So do a fun drill. And this way, no matter how hard that practice was that day, they at least leave the field remembering that they had a good time and they want to come back. Um, and at the very, very end, you do want to make sure you ask them what they learned. You may not think that's important, but it is because you may have been teaching something a certain way and you say, hey guys, what'd you learn? And they're like, oh, I learned blah, blah, blah. And it's not even close to what you were trying to teach them. And so you, that's your time to go, oh, no, no. You know, I'm glad that you feel that way. This is what it actually is. And then you can teach them exactly what you wanted to say. And if parents are there for the end of it too, you can tell them, okay, we, we worked on, um, you know, backhand, front hand. This is what we did. This is how you feel it. Um, this way the parents are on board too, if they happen to be there, but make sure you ask them what they learned and then you can reinforce it. So that way they know they leave the field knowing exactly what you want them to know, not some kind of um, distorted version of what you had tried to teach them. And very end, we all say, you know, one, two, three, go, you know, cheer, have some, some team spirit in there. Okay, so your first practice is gonna look a little different. The first part of your first practice is gonna be a lot of administrative stuff. You should have a binder, and somewhere in your binder, you'll have your contact list, your players, their age, emails, all that. So what you're gonna do in the first practice is have the parents look at it and make sure that that information is correct. So they may have an email address that's better than what they had put in the registration, or they don't wanna give you a cell phone number that's better than what's on here. So have them look at it and then have them give you the best mode of contact for them. Some people prefer email, some people prefer text, ask them what they prefer and then you can go with that. Okay. There used to be a safety plan in here. Now it is online. So uh, most of you, your safety plans will be online and your safety officer can help you get a hold of that if you need to. Another thing you will have in your binder are metal releases. These are very important. You have to have these at every practice and every game and it must be a wet signature, which means it's not a photocopy of a signature. It's an actual signature on this piece of paper. So you'll go through, have all your parents sign it. A lot of leagues have digital copies put in the binders. Um, and so you will have to have your parents come in and actually sign them on day one. Um, so you can go through, make sure that they have their emergency contact on there and any medical conditions. I like to go through and look what's on there and make sure that I, I will tab to like peanut allergy or whatever the case may be for certain things. So that way I remember this kid has to have an EpiPen at every practice and every game. They must bring all their medications to every practice and game, not just games, must be to practices as well. And it cannot be expired. So a lot of times an epi might be good a little bit afterwards and the parents know that and everybody knows that, but for little league purposes, it cannot be expired. You must go by that date. So if it says May, 2021, at the end of May, 2021, they cannot use it anymore. They must have one that's past, that's June or past. Um, and they can use that other one for at home or whatever else, but for little league purposes, for insurance purposes, they must bring unexpired medications for every game and practice. And that's for um, inhalers, EpiPens, 
um, those kind of medications, if it's Ritalin or if it's something like a pill that they take every day, they do not need to bring that. We get that question a lot. Anything like that, they do not need to bring that to every game and practice. Only those, those life-saving interventions that you must have at a game or practice. Um, so that is your medical releases. In addition to the medical releases, a lot of leagues have parent code of conducts, you have players code of conducts, and coaches code of conduct. So make sure whatever your league requires, all of those are done. And in the binder, so that when you're tournament season, you're all ready to go. So during this first meeting, after you get them to sign all the medical releases, sign all the code of conducts, so you make sure their contacts are nice and order. Um, then you guys can get together and pick out your team name, your team colors or whatever, unless you've already decided that beforehand. But this is uh, day one is when you will make all those executive decisions and do all the administrative work. And then during your first practice, the practice itself will be a little bit different too. Instead of, um, you can do a get to know you game as a warm up where you're like, you know, my name is so-and-so, my favorite team is the Yankees. What's your favorite team? And so the kids can play some kind of game where they all get to know each other and a little bit about each other to get that team camaraderie together. Rule books. It used to be that you get a paper rule book and then you can look through it, find something, tab it out, highlight what you want, etc. Now there's an app on your phone, the Little League Rulebook app. It's great because all the rules are there. If there's an update, if Little League makes an update in Williamsport, whatever, um, it automatically updates on the app. So you don't have to find out the rules from some umpire telling you or somebody else telling you, looking it up, make sure it's true, and then write it down in the rule book. This is the new change. It automatically updates it into your app. So you don't need to do that. The app, it's great because there's a search function on there. So you only have a certain amount of time, which is before the next pitch is thrown to protest a call. So if you're unsure of a rule between pitcher to catcher and you think the other team's not following it, you search it up on the Little League app. It'll tell you the rule, boom, done. You can make your protest to the umpire before the next pitch is thrown instead of having to go through that your paper rule book and try to find where it was. So it's actually pretty cool. So far, I like it. And now we will discuss pitching. So there are pitching limits per age. Um, so a 13 year old can only pitch so many pitches. A catcher can only catch so many pitches before he is not allowed to pitch himself. Uh, I think it's innings now. Um, so make sure that you are familiar with all the rules on pitching and catching and vice versa. Know the limits, they're there for a reason. Um, so how do you keep track of pitching? There's a, I mean, you have your pitch counter um, and it's gonna have more than one keeping track because it changes. Um, I always, I get too involved in the game because I'm watching it and I totally forget to, uh, to click the pitch counter sometimes. Um, so make sure that, you know, if you have more than one, it's great. And you can always ask the scorekeeper, especially during a tournament, you want to ask the scorekeeper in between, um, inning so that way you know exactly how much your kid pitched. You don't want to be in the, the wrong page and then find out you have to pull your pitcher out now and you're not your other guy's not ready yet. So make sure that you know where you're at. So here is the pitching log. I will show you a close up. So you have pitcher's name, uniform number so they can be seen across the field, league age uh, so that way both sides know what the pitching limits are and then you have these little boxes. So every pitch that is thrown you put a dash. And then at the end of that batter, when that batter is retired or he makes it to base, you put an X so you know how many pitches each batter got. And then at the end, you can tally them all up. So that is the pitching log. Now, the pitching affidavit looks like this. Minors and above, you will definitely need this. And every tournament, you will be required to have this. So make sure that you know how to fill it out now and how to use it now before tournament season because you need at least a week before tournaments um, records on there. Okay, so now we are gonna go over how to fill out a pitching log and a pitching affidavit. First in front of me, I have the pitching log. These are pretty self-explanatory. You put the date on it up here. Down here, you're gonna put the pitcher's name. So let's put Joe DiMaggio. We're gonna put uniform number, and then we're gonna put league age. Now, as the pitcher is pitching, you're gonna put a little slash mark on here. And then when he comes to the end of the batter, you are going to put an X. For example, let's say the first batter comes up. He does strike, ball, 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 second strike, ball, he's at full count. And then uh, the last one is a ball, he walked him. So he's got 
seven pitches on him so far. Now, the next batter comes up. Let's say he does strike, strike, ball. He strikes him out. So now he's at 11 pitches. Now he's got another kid comes up. This kid's a lefty. For some reason, he's got a whole bunch of fouls. <laughs> and then we'll say he ends at 18. That was his last pitch. Now the last batter comes up. Let's say ball, ball, strike, strike. And then he strikes him out at 23. So now his final pitch count is 23. Let's move on to our pitching affidavit now. The pitching affidavit should be filled out at least one week prior to tournaments, but you should have this all season long. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that. So you'll put your league name up top there. Your team name goes there. And let's start filling it out from our pitching log. So let's say the date. Let's go 3-17-2021. So first name, Joe. Last name, DiMaggio. Uniform number, we got five league age, 13. So number of pitches, he threw 23. So if you look down here, 23 pitches, that would be one day rest. However, because he started that last batter, and that's why we do the lines and then the X at the end, is 19. So because he started that batter at 19, that's the number of pitchers he's used for days of rest, which is under 20, which means days of rest would be zero, so he is eligible to pitch the next day. Um, so let's say he started that batter. Let's see, 22. If he had started that batter, let's see, he did a bunch more, blah, 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 blah. And then he started the next batter. Let's see here. And let's say he started the next batter at 37, and end it at 39. Then he would have pitches thrown, would be 39. Threshold used, because he started it under 35, he would only have one day of rest, and then here you would put uh, 21 to 35. And then they can go and check the pitching log to be sure that that's what happened. Um, then the official scorekeeper is going to sign that during tournaments. That will be the official scorekeeper that signs that, or the site director. And then during regular season games, you can have the umpire do it um, or any league official that your league has designated to sign that. And this is what you will need for your tournaments, and you should have it all season. This is the pitching affidavit. And again, this one with all the little slashy marks, that is your pitching log. And you should be familiar with both of those. Now let's talk about why those pitching limits exist. So anybody that knows me personally knows I will go crazy over over pitching your kids so when you see the kid out there and he starts he starts doing this chances are he's he's just about done and if he keeps doing it pull him out it's not worth it it is not worth ruining an eight-year-old's arm just so you can win one little league game that doesn't even matter because our their end game is you know to go to high school to get a scholarship to go to college like that's when their baseball career becomes a lot more important. Nobody cares if you won a Little League game at the age of 10 or 12. Nobody cares. What's important is that kid's shoulder is healthy so that way he can grow up and pitch or catch or whatever it is that he's doing. So do not over-pitch your kid for a Little League game. Um, if that kid is also playing travel ball, if you can, please contact the other coach. Do not rely on the kid because... I love kids, you love kids, but they're little liars. They will lie to you and be like, oh no, I didn't pitch yesterday. They could have pitched 65 pitches in a game. They're gonna tell you no, because they wanna pitch. And if you ask them, hey, how's your arm? Can you pitch today? They're always gonna say yes. It could be falling out of socket and they're still gonna tell you yes, because a lot of these kids love this game and they do not wanna be pulled out and they do not wanna disappoint their team and they don't wanna disappoint you. So you have to be the adult in the situation See what's going on, and then you make the correct assessment whether he really can play or it's best if he takes him out. And sometimes parents will get mad at that too, but you have to do what's right for that kid and his shoulder health. I have some of my baseball kids that, you know, have grown up. They went to high school. 
They did high school and travel at the same time. They're getting over pitched. They've already had to have a surgery. Some of them torn some things that now it's not the same and they, they've quit playing baseball in the prime in their senior year of high school and they can't play anymore because some coach had to over pitch them because they had to win a game. So don't be, don't be that person. Uh, put your children's health, your, your player's health above winning a game. And that concludes our general session of coaching for the Coaches Clinic. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, uh, email, text message, whatever you like. Um, I'm always available.